Hello, Covenant class, and anyone else who might be listening. This is Revelation Revealed, Lesson 9, which covers Revelation chapters 16, 17, and 18. I'm Steve Meeker, and along with my wife, Judy, we are coming to you from our house because it's uh, near the end of March in the year 2020, a very interesting time in the world and our country. We began this class back in January at the Ark Church in Conroe, Texas, meeting in person with a, a lively group of uh, people that are interested in Revelation. But as the last few weeks, we have not been able to meet in person. We wanted to complete the course in a way that you could um, benefit from it at home. The picture you're seeing there of Judy and me was taken on the island of Patmos about five years ago when we had the opportunity to visit there. And the island of Patmos, as you probably know, is where John was when he had the revelation. So it was exciting for us to get to see that in person. Before we begin the lesson today, I want to tell you about a personal experience I had many years ago involving a very special building. Now, this lesson actually, this uh, story actually does relate to the lesson. I don't want you to think I'm just wasting your time. I hate to admit it because I've been a professional educator for 40 years now, but when I was in high school, I really wasn't a very good student. I was kind of a slacker. I didn't really take things seriously. And so one day in my senior year, I wandered into my counselor's office and I said I should uh, probably think about college or something for next year. And she took up my transcript and uh, opened it up and kind of shuddered a little bit, but she said uh, she found one A. I made it, had made an A in photography. And she said, well, you seem to like photography. And I said, yeah, I like taking pictures pretty good. And so she um, uh, handed me a catalog for Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas, because they have a good photography school. And on the front of the catalog was this picture. Well, I didn't think that was a real place. I'd never seen anything like that anywhere where I'd grown up. And so I kind of thought it was a fantasy picture or something like that. But a few weeks later, I made a trip to Huntsville and saw that the old main building actually was a real thing. And I was really stunned by it. First of all, it was huge. It sat on top of this large hill on campus. It had these magnificent Gothic spires that soared high into the sky and these very, very steep gabled roofs. It was just awesome to look at. It was awe-inspiring, powerful, and imposing, and yet somehow at the same time, it was welcoming and very approachable. Really a magnificent place. Upstairs on the second floor was a beautiful old auditorium. All the seats were wood, the floor was wood, uh, the side panelings were wood as well, oil stained, it smelled terrific. And then along the sides were these beautiful stained glass windows depicting different scenes from Texas history. You could always hear music coming from up there. A lot of times it was different uh, sections of the band that were practicing, sometimes just getting together for an informal jam session. It was always fun to go by and listen to the music that was coming out of the auditorium. It smelled great inside, like old wood and beeswax polish. Old Main had been built in 1889, and all over campus you could find pictures of Old Main from throughout the years. And I don't know, it was always uh, comforting to see that other students and other people had enjoyed the building as much as I had throughout time. And that's me on the left in 1977. Yeah, the 70s, they were a happening time, weren't they? My brother and my sister-in-law came by to visit. My sister-in-law was pregnant at the time, and of course I wanted to show them Old Main. Unfortunately, my sloppy study habits followed me from high school to college, and my first year I didn't really set the world on fire academically. I wasn't too sure I liked college all that much. So that summer I went back home and worked for a rock mason. I spent the whole summer out in the heat, hauling bricks, hauling mud, hauling rocks. Uh, it was hot. It was a lot of work. And by the end of that summer, I decided maybe I would try college again and be a little more serious about it this time. And so I made my way back to Huntsville the next fall. Now, I learned a lot about rock masonry that I had never known before and uh, more than I ever wanted to know. However, when I got back and take a, took a look at Old Main, I noticed a lot more of the details of the beautiful masonry work that had been done on it. it must have taken thousands of man hours to do all that work. 
and I had a new appreciation for it. The lawn area out in front of Old Main was always a fun place for students to gather, and several of my friends and I had become in the habit of uh, after dinner on Wednesdays, we would take our guitars and a group of us would just uh, sit out there in a circle and we'd sing worship songs and just worship the Lord right out there. Uh, one day, these three girls came and sat down and joined us. And two years later, I married one of them. That's my first wife, Sherry. Sherry and I were married for 27 years before she passed away in 2007. You can probably tell that I really loved this building. It's just a gorgeous place, very special to me. You can just sit for hours and look at it, the, the magnificent spires, the beautiful arches, the uh, delicate masonry that have been um, graced its facade. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. The fact that I had met my first wife there made it that much more special to me. It seemed to me like it had been there forever. And in fact, I thought it would be there forever. No one knows exactly how it started. Um, the, the thinking was that probably the wiring in the old auditorium had sh uh, shorted out and that oil stained wood made a great uh, starting place for a fire. By the time anyone noticed that the building was on fire, it was fully engulfed. In fact, the flames were so intense that it caught another historic building on fire uh, next to it. Several brave students actually grabbed fire extinguishers and, and uh, broke into that building and saved it. It's still there today. But Old Main was gone. Everyone was sad. The clouds of smoke hung over town for a full week afterwards as it continued to smolder. Everybody was distraught at this beautiful building that they'd seen every day of their lives on top of this hill. Suddenly it was gone. The next day I walked up to see what was left. Those magnificent spires that once soared high in the air, well, they now lay crumbled on the ground. The beautiful stained glass windows completely dissolved. All that delicate brickwork that had once so elegantly graced the facade had now crashed down into the lawn and even into the street below. It was devastating. As I stood there looking at the very sad scene, like losing a, a dear friend. I heard God speak to me very clearly, no, not audibly, but in that very clear, still, small voice. And this is what he said. Don't ever put your trust in the things of this world because it's all temporary. It was really one of the most poignant moments in my life. You know, everything that we see around us, everything that we know, it's all temporary. I'd been a Christian for many years by that time. I had been um, involved in ministry on campus. I already was in my career. Um, yet I got to admit that um, I was still trying to direct my life. Oh, I wanted God along to bless my plans, but I still wanted to be in charge. But I'll tell you the truth that from that day up until today, for the most part, I have managed to keep my hands off the wheel and give it to God. And really giving my life to God, to Christ, has made all the difference. Thank you for listening to that story. And by the time we finish this lesson, I think you'll understand why we included it. So we're now beginning Revelation Revealed, Lesson 9, starting with chapter 16, 17, and 18. The primary reference I used in developing this class is a book called The Revelation of John, a Narrative Commentary by Dr. James L. Rasigi. Dr. Rasigi's book is, I believe, the most scholarly book I've ever read on any topic. It's very meaty. Uh, the references are tremendous. I highly recommend that you have it in your library, but I'll warn you, you're not going to just breeze through it. It's, like I said, very meaty. It takes some time to work your way through it. I will remind you of something I mentioned during our first lesson that I think is the reason why many people have trouble understanding Revelation, because it's different from the rest of the Bible. Most books of the Bible have a definite starting point 
and a definite ending point. And in between, the action pretty much proceeds in a straight line chronologically. The book of Revelation, on the other hand, while it does have definite starting points and ending points, in between those two points, the action doesn't always proceed chronologically. In fact, at times, the action lurches forward, such as in chapter 7 when we see the sealing of the saints. And then at other times, the action flashes way back to the past, such as chapter 12, which details a war which took place in heaven even before humans were on the earth. There are also multiple layers of activity going on, sometimes several things at one time. Sometimes things are happening in heaven and on the earth, and so it becomes a little bit complicated to follow at times. You have to get it in your mindset that Revelation is not like the rest of the Bible. It doesn't proceed in a straight line chronologically. In our previous lessons, in chapter 13, we see the emergence of a sea beast and a land beast. And these are part of Satan's trinity. He is trying to mimic the lamb. He's trying to be like God. He's trying to usurp God's authority on the earth and set himself up as God. And in chapter 14, we see two harvests. The first is the grain harvest, which is the rapture of the church, those who believe in Christ. The second is the grape harvest for those who have followed after the beast and have taken his mark. And there's a very bloody scene at the end of chapter 14 uh, for those who have um, followed after the beast and incur God's wrath. In chapter 15, we see seven angels coming out of the temple <clears throat> and holding seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God. Now, in chapter 16, we're going to see the pace picking up as those bowls are poured out and uh, different uh, plagues fall on the earth. Unlike the um, seals and the trumpets in chapter 6 and 9, which had a break between the 6th and the 7th event, the bowls lack any such break, confirming the strong angel's promise of no more delay from back in chapter 10. Now, if you have your study guide, I believe we are on page 42. And the author makes a point here about the patterns that we're going to see in the bowls. Each of the bowls follows a predictable pattern. An angel who is identified by number appears. The angel pours out his bowl. The earth, the sea, rivers and springs, sun, the kingdom of the beast, the Euphrates, and the air all suffer the effects of the outpouring. The consequences are described. And in the sixth and seventh bowl, the pattern is expanded. Three times, the narrator comments on the people's response to the plagues. As we have said many times during the course of this study, there are many parallels between the book of Exodus in the Old Testament and the book of Revelation. In both, you have the people of God going through a foreign land to reach their promised land, their home. And uh, we have many parallels to Exodus as well in this section. In chapter 16, verse 2, we're going to see sores emerge on the people who have taken the mark. That parallels the language in Exodus 9. We're going to see water turned to blood in verses 3 and 4. That parallels Exodus chapter 7. We're going to see darkness fall on the land in verse 10. That parallels Exodus chapter 10. And we're going to see the river cursed in verse 12. And that also uh, as a parallel to Exodus chapter 8. And so let's read Revelation 16, verse 1 and 2. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worship his image. And so the first angel comes out of the temple and pours out his bowl on the earth. Now, before I move any further, when we see temple in Revelation, it's not talking about an actual physical building, but it is re referencing the location of where God dwells. Later, John marvels when he sees the New Jerusalem that there is no actual temple there. That was surprising to him because most cities in the ancient world had temples. Even pagan cities had temples. 
So he pours out his bowl on the earth, producing painful sores on those who have the mark of the beast and who worship its image. Now, there have been some people who have suggested that the mark of the beast may actually not be visible, perhaps like the computer chip that you might have on your pet that uh, the veterinarian puts in in case your animal gets lost and somebody finds them, they can scan it and have your information. But if it was not visible before, well, now it is visible because those who, um, uh, who have uh, followed after this false god uh, have festering boils appearing all over their skin. The outer corruption of their flesh parallels their inner corruption in following after the beast. Verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. And so the second angel pours out his bowl onto the sea, turning it into blood and killing every living thing. In Revelation, the sea represents the abode of evil and chaos. The bottomless pit or the abyss is associated with the sea. The first beast arises from the sea in chapter 13, verse 1. Although the sea beast is not destroyed until later, the death knell is sounded with the second bowl plague. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they turned into blood. Now I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are just, the one who is and who was, the Holy One, because you have passed these judgments, because they poured out the blood of your saints and prophets, so you have given them blood to drink. They got what they deserved. Then I heard the altar reply, Yes, Lord God, the All-Powerful, your judgments are true and just. And so the third angel poured out his bowl onto the rivers and the springs of flesh, fresh water, and they turned to blood. This angel then is heard commenting on the justness of God's judgment. Because they have poured out the blood of your saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. They got what they deserved. And then the altar replies, Yes, Lord God, the All-Powerful, your judgments are true and just. Now, it's not exactly clear whose voice this is, but perhaps the souls of those who have been martyred for their faith. If you'll recall back in chapter 6, the fifth uh, seal showed us the altar in heaven, and underneath the altar we see the souls of those who have been martyred for their testimony in Christ Jesus. And so perhaps these are the ones who are calling out uh, this, uh, this reply, saying, Yes, Lord, the All-Powerful, your judgments are true and just. Uh, or it even could be the altar itself. Verse 8 and 9, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was permitted to scorch people with fire. Thus people were scorched by the terrible heat. Yet they blasphemed the name of God, who has ruling authority over these plagues, and they would not repent and give him glory. So we have the fourth angel now pouring out his bowl on the sun, which is given permission to burn people. In fact, the wording is very clear. A two-step progression emphasizes the extremity of the plague. It was allowed to scorch them, and they were scorched by the fierce heat. The word allowed indicates that the sun wasn't acting on its own, but was actually responding to directions from God. Now, you recall back in chapter 7, verse 16 through 17, those that had been sealed by God, those that uh, had followed after Christ, they were given a promise that the sun would not beat down on them. They would not suffer from any scorching heat. The lamb will shepherd them and lead them to springs of living water. But by contrast, the followers of the beast in chapter 16, they were scorched by the terrible heat. They were unprotected by the shadow of the lamb. Yet, rather than repenting and giving glory to God, they became like the beasts they follow. They blasphemed God. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, so that darkness covered his kingdom. And people began to bite their tongues because of their pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their suffering and because of their sores, but nevertheless, they still refused to repent of their deeds. So in verses 10 and 11, we see the fifth bowl poured out on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom is plunged into darkness. Now, generally in Revelation, the word throne is reserved uh, for a reference to God. 
However, three times it refers to Satan. Uh, in chapter 2, you recall the church at Pergamon was said to be located where Satan's throne is. In chapter 13, we see that the sea beast was drawing power from the dragon's throne. And in chapter 16, 10 here, we see the throne of the beast represents his claim to dominion over the world. The beast's throne contends with God's throne for the loyalties of the human heart. Let's talk about darkness a little bit. Darkness is thrust upon the beast's kingdom. That corresponds to the religious, moral, and political darkness that characterizes his reign. The followers of the beast respond to being cast into darkness by gnawing their tongues in agony. Yet, rather than repent, they continue to blaspheme God. And that's really odd. They have to recognize that God is God. Yet, their stubbornness drives them to give their allegiance to the counterfeit deity who claims sovereignty. Their inner darkness matches the darkness of the plague. Chapter 16, verses 12 through 14. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and dried up its waters to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs coming up out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of the demons performing signs who go out to the kings of the earth to bring them together for the battle that will take place on the great day of God, the All-Powerful. The physical Euphrates River flows from Syria, southeast through the country of Iraq, modern-day country of Iraq, and it nurtured ancient Babylon. And there are some scholars that believe that this is what is being referred to here in these verses. But more likely, there is a different uh, explanation. It's more likely a spiritual reference than a physical reference. We'll come back and look at this map again in a little bit. And so what do we mean by a spiritual reference here? A figurative reference rather than the physical Euphrates River. Well, keep in mind there are only two cities mentioned in Revelation. The New Jerusalem, which represents heaven, and Babylon the Great, which represents the anti-God culture of this world. So as the physical Euphrates used to nourish the ancient city of Babylon, this spiritual Euphrates nourishes the Babylon the Great, the anti-God culture of this world. The author writes that it flows through the anti-God city and brings destruction in sharp contrast to the river which flows from God's throne and sustains the inhabitants of the eternal city. This Euphrates is dried up, allowing the kings from the rising of the sun to cross and battle the forces of good. In verse 13 and 14, John saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Evidently, false prophet is now a new name for the beast of the land who appeared back in chapter 13, verse 11 through 18. He will reappear again in chapters 19 and 20. Now, in John's world, the mouth reveals one's character. Out of Christ's mouth comes a sharp sword, indicating the way he conquers with his words. Out of the dragon's mouth comes a flood of destruction. Out of the mouth of the sea beast comes haughty and blasphemous words. And out of the mouth of the second beast comes demonic speech. Well, here in chapter 16, verse 13 through 14, unclean spirits come out of the mouths of the counterfeit trinity. They go out to assemble recruits from the kings of the world for battle on the great day of God, the Almighty. Revelation 16, verse 15. Look, I will come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays alert and does not lose his clothes so that he will not have to walk around naked and his shameful condition be seen. All right, well, here suddenly in verse 15, we have a very abrupt message from Christ. Look, I will come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays alert and does not lose his clothes so that he will not have to walk around naked and a shameful condition be seen. This message seems to interrupt the flow of the proceedings, reminding us that Jesus' coming is unexpected, intrusive, and sudden, like a thief in the night. We've seen other references in the New Testament that remind us of this. Watchfulness, a state of readiness that ignores the voice of the dominant culture that advocates compromise, is Jesus' remedy for spiritual lethargy. We have mentioned several times in Revelation that clothing is very important throughout Revelation, clothing and lack of clothing. 
And here we see it again. Jesus links staying alert and watchful with not losing your clothes. Outward garments reflect the inner state. To be naked is to be exposed to the shame of being unprepared spiritually, whereas to be clothed is to be ready for the unexpected intruder. Back in uh, chapter 3, you remember the church at Laodicea. They thought they were dressed, but they were not. And also in chapter 3, some at the church of Sardis were clothed, but their garments were soiled. The abruptness of the end time requires a, re a readiness or watchfulness that is symbolized by clothing. Verse 16. Now the spirits gathered the kings and their armies to the place that is called Armageddon in Hebrew. If you look at the picture on this uh, slide, you'll see that uh, is the plain of Armageddon in northern Israel. We'll talk about this more in just a little bit. Now on that previous picture, it was the plain of Armageddon, but the place is called Armageddon or Harmageddon in Hebrew. And that prefix Har actually means mountain, thus the mountain of Mageddon or Megiddo. Megiddo was the site of many famous battles between Israel and its enemies. You see the Old Testament references there. It's usually referred to as the Plain of Megiddo. And in fact, Judy and I were on a tour of Israel in 2019, and uh, the driver stopped and told us that we were actually on the Plain of Megiddo. There were no mountains around. So John, referring to it here as a mountain, suggests that perhaps it's a figurative reference, not a physical reference, or at least not only a physical reference. It's a mountain of victory for God and those who follow the Lamb rather than an actual mountain. Earlier, when we looked at this map, we were looking at the Euphrates River in current-day Iraq, and the demonic forces had drained it and had gone to recruit forces from the east. So what's east of Iraq? Well, there's Iran, further east is even China, and there are many uh, scholars that will talk about that this is leading up to an actual physical battle there on Armageddon where you see the, the arrow pointed. Let's look at another map. This is a map of the modern day country of Israel and where you see on the arrow is the plain of Megiddo that we talked about earlier. Now that plain was the site of many victories in the Old Testament for Israel. But John refers to it as Armageddon meaning mountain and so it is a mountain of victory not necessarily a physical mountain but a mountain of victory now there are some commentators that believe that there is an actual battle that's going to take place here and you can understand why with uh, the presence of Syria right next door this certainly is a trouble spot in the world however it's more relevant for Christians to realize the figurative nature of this battle because that involves us more directly the author, Dr. Rasiji, writes that the location of the great battle may not be on a physical map, but rather on John's spiritual map. In fact, the battle is not even described in chapter 16 because the battle was already won on the cross. The message from Jesus in verse 15 is linked to the announcement of the battle in verse 16. It interrupts the flow of the narrative of the bowls and brings the story to a new dimension. No longer is the story just about forces of evil assembling for a great battle against God. It's also about Christians' readiness for the end and the need to fill the interval between times with vigilant resistance to the Babylon's self-deifying ways. For Christians, the great battle turns out to be an individual spiritual battle. Blessed is the one who stays alert. Revelation 16, verse 17 through 21. Finally, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. Then there were flashes of lightning, roaring and crashes of thunder, and there was a tremendous earthquake, an earthquake unequaled since humanity has been on the earth. So tremendous was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. So Babylon the Great was remembered before God and was given the cup filled with the wine made of God's furious wrath. Every island fled away and no mountains could be found. And gigantic hailstones weighing about a hundred pounds each fell from heaven on people. But they blasphemed God because of the plague of hail since it was so horrendous. And so finally the seventh angel pours out his bowl into the air and a loud voice from the temple and the throne proclaim, It is done. 
Perhaps this is God's voice confirming that the plan of salvation and judgment is accomplished. This pronouncement is accentuated by an incredible display of cosmic manifestations. Tremendous crashes of thunder, lightning, earthquakes, unequaled in human history, and hundred-pound hailstones pummel the earth. The great city Babylon is broken into three pieces by the fury of God's wrath. Islands and mountains disappear. The people still did not repent. Rather, they continued to blaspheme God. And chapter 16 ends, but the narrative continues going on. So now we go to chapter 17. Revelation 17 is divided into two sections. Part 1 is the vision of the judgment of the great whore. Part 2 is an interpretation of the vision by an angelic guide. The primary trait of the woman in Revelation 17 is that she is a whore. Words normally associated with pornography are used to clearly establish the woman's character. In verse 2, the people of the earth become drunk with the wine of her fornications, and the kings of the earth fornicate with her. The golden cup contains the impurities of her fornications. In verse 5, she is called the mother of whores. Now you might be wondering, why does John use such strong language? Well, the strong language emphasizes the crossing of boundaries that are established through covenant relationships. You may recall the Old Testament prophet Hosea. God instructed Hosea to marry a prostitute. He did, had children with her, and then she ran off. And God instructed Hosea to go and buy her out of slavery again the second time and marry her again, demonstrating God's love for Israel, even though Israel was unfaithful. Well, here, the same type of, uh, of reference is used. It goes beyond sexual immorality. The transgression and compromise detailed by the whore's harlotry are also metaphors for engaging in religious, economic, social, and political intercourse with Babylon and the dominant culture. The whore of chapter 17 and the bride of chapter 21 are introduced with similar terms, forming an intentional contrast. In both, an angel tells John to come and see. The contrast between the good and the evil woman is made because the differences may appear subtle to the casual observer. Evil appears good, but is deceptive. The stark, offensive sexual language helps awaken the reader to the choices of the apocalypse. Revelation 17, 1 and 2. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. And so in chapter 17, verse 1, the whore is seen seated on many waters. Now, later on in verse 15, the angel explains that these waters are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages of the earth. We see that four-part description used frequently in Revelation, although the, the words are sometimes in different order. Also remember that number four symbolizes the whole earth. Like God, she is seen seated. Now, this is a, a judicial reference. Uh, sometimes we might even today say that a certain judge sits over a certain precinct. That means he has ruling he or she has ruling power over that area. Well, here it sits as a reference to the great prostitute's ruling power. While God sits on a throne, the whore sits on waters in, uh, in verse 1, on a beast in verse 3, and on 7, and remember 7 is the number of completion, 7 mountains in verse 9. She rules the, over the whole earth and attempts to rival God's throne. Verse 3 and 4. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. In verse 3, John is carried away in the spirit to the wilderness. Now, you remember back in chapter 12, the woman found a place of sanctuary and protection in the wilderness. But here, in chapter 17, the wilderness is a de desolate, depopulated landscape, symbolizing Babylon's destruction. This is a foreshadowing of what we're going to see in just a little bit in chapter 18, verse 2, which details the destruction of Babylon. In verse 4, John describes the woman's clothing. She is dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. 
In the ancient world, purple dye was expensive. Only the wealthy and rulers could afford purple clothing. Scarlet, the color red, ties her to the color of the beast. Her blaring adornment are a product of her economic harlotry as detailed in chapter 18, including slaves and human lives. While her adornment resembles that of the bride in chapter 21, her wealth was accumulated through illicit affairs. Verse 5 and 6. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. On her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of whores, and of the detestable things or the abominations of the earth. The followers of the Lamb had God's seal on their forehead back in chapter 7. The followers of the beast have his name on their forehead too in chapter 13 and 14. The woman's stamp reveals that she is an infamous city of political dominion and military might. Great is descriptive of her stunning grandeur, which leaves even John astounded. The mother of whores was abomina and abominations ties her to Jezebel from back in chapter 2, where we had one letter of, to the churches that made a reference to Jezebel. Both are symbolic with promiscuous compromise and adulterous assimilation to the popular culture. In verse 6, John states that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and of those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. This recalls back in chapter 14, verse 8, and also 16, 6, where we see that an angel announces the fall of Babylon the Great, who made the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornications. Because they drank the blood of the people of God, their waters were turned into blood in return. John admits that when he saw her, he was greatly astonished. This recalls back in chapter 13, where the people of the earth were greatly amazed by the beast from the sea. John has to steel himself against the seduction of the whore's apparent attractiveness. The contents of her golden cup are an enticing allure. Verse 7 and 8, Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written on the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. So here we go with part two of Revelation 17. And it begins with verse 7. The angelic guide interprets what John has seen. The woman sits on the beast with seven heads and ten horns, which is identical to the beast from the sea that we saw back in chapter 13. The beguiling face of the woman hides evil's ugly, beastly reality. She is the enticing allure which beguiles the people of the earth into following beastly evil. Her seven heads and ten horns announce her claim to complete sovereignty and total power. Now, we've mentioned several times how the beast tries to mimic the lamb, and we see another example of it here. Back in uh, chapter 1, John described God as the one who was and is and is to come. Well, in 17.8, the beast description twice attempts to mimic that three-part description of God. The beast you saw was and is not, but is about to come up from the abyss, then go to destruction. We're going to see something similar in verse 11. The beast appearance elicits amazement from those whose names are not written in the book of life. Again, this recalls chapter 13, when the people were amazed by the beast appearance after having an apparent fatal wound. In fact, this may be another description of that same event. Verse 9, 10, and 11. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is. The other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was, and now is not, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven, and is going to his destruction. Well, we have a lot to unpack here in these three verses, so let's dig into them. In uh, 17, 9, and 10, the angelic guide interprets the symbolism of the seven hills and the seven heads. Now, often Rome, the city of Rome, is famous for its seven hills. There have been a lot of commentators that have tried to create a list of Roman emperors that would correspond to this description, but uh, none of them are 
uh, completely satisfactory. They all have some problems. It's also common to list several great world empires, for example, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greece, Rome, and then the Antichrist, which is described as the seventh and then the eighth. However, this fails to take into account other great empires which emerged after Rome, like the Spanish, the British, etc. So is this list talking about an actual group of empires on the earth, or is there perhaps another explanation? And keep in mind that the book of Revelation is quite figurative, particularly dealing with numbers. And the author says that, as always in Revelation, seven is the number of completeness. Thus, the seven kings are emblematic of a total or complete human rule that engages in self-deifying activities. Now keep in mind, we've talked quite a bit about how the beast tries to imitate Christ. And this reference here to the Antichrist, he's trying to link himself to Christ as well. In verse 11, the angelic guide elaborates on the three-part description of the beast. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. Now, what does this eighth mean? One possible explanation is that eight is a counterfeit reference to Christ, or again, to the Antichrist. Now, numbers are always important in Revelation, but eight is unusual. We don't really see the number eight anywhere else. So is there a connection between the number eight and Jesus Christ? Well, there is one. Uh, there have been several that have been suggested, but the one that's the strongest has something to do with a uh, system that was used with the old Greek alphabet. In ancient Greece, there was a commonly used system which assigned numbers to the letters of the Greek alphabet. It was known as the Greek Ionic Ciphered Numeral System. And if you add up all the numbers in Jesus' name, it totals 888. Now, those of you who grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s may remember that uh, early telephone numbers the first two digits were actually given in letters. In my hometown, they would say Clearwater 73405. The first two letters, CL for Clearwater, were actually 25, but you'd look on the rotary dial and find the C and the L. I suppose they thought people couldn't remember seven numbers. The same type of system is what we're seeing here, that letters of the Greek alphabet have a number that's also assigned to them. Now you see the slide here showing you that the name of Jesus in Greek was spelled Iota, Eta, Sigma, Omicron, Upsilon, and Sigma. And uh, down below you can see the values of each of those letters, and they would all add up to 888. And so in this way there is a connection between Jesus and the number 8, and so the reference to the Antichrist being the 8th is once again he is trying to mimic the lamb he's trying to be like jesus and so that ties him in to the lamb verse 12 through 14 the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast they will they have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast they will wage war against the lamb but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Various commentators have tried to figure out the meaning of these ten kings. Some have linked them to the Roman Empire, while others interpret them as members of the European community or another kind of ten-nation confederacy. But the number ten is figurative representing totality. We talked about this during our first lesson. It represents totality, fullness, or completeness. In this case, it represents the total earthly opposition to the Lamb. The ruling period of ten kings along with the beast is described as one hour. This is repeated three times in chapter 18. Although time periods in Revelation are symbolic, they can also be considered proportional. The king's earthly reign is short-lived. The period of time captures evil's failed ascendancy, a reign that is already defeated by God's act in Christ. Their failure is highlighted in verse 14 by a war that they cannot possibly win. Verse 15 through 18. Then the angelic guide said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast 
and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. The rest of chapter 17 uses harsh, unsettling images to describe a civil war that displays evil's self-destructive nature. Isn't it amazing that sin has in itself its own destruction? Three metaphors describe the whore's destruction, stripping her naked, eating her flesh, and setting her on fire. Nakedness, as we've determined earlier, is a sign of shame. Her garish purple and scarlet clothing are now gone. Her gold and jewels are nowhere to be found. Back in 1615, remember that interruption from Jesus in the middle of the narrative? Jesus stated that blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. Well, now Babylon's shame is striking. Her impoverished economic, political, and spiritual condition is now laid bare for all to see. The kings and beasts devour the woman's flesh. This is a foreshadowing of the ravenous carrion feast at the end of the apocalypse where scavenging birds gorge themselves on the mighty and the fallen. As if having her flesh eaten isn't enough, the kings and beasts set her on fire. Her ruination is complete. Like the beast, she is destined for destruction. Chapter 17 draws to a close. Let's look at this statement by the author of the book, Dr. Rasiji. The violent language is unsettling. Yet the scene is one of the self-destructive nature of evil, a truth which has been proclaimed throughout the apocalypse from the four horsemen onwards. Evil and injustice bear within themselves the seeds of their own destruction, and ultimately the whole edifice will come tumbling down. In chapter 17, John sees the whore, Babylon the Great, drunk with the blood of the saints. Now he hears a lengthy funeral dirge for Babylon's fall from great heights. Now you recall back in Revelation 4 and 5, the four creatures, the elders, the angels, and the whole creation join in praise of the one who sits on the throne and for the Lamb, that beautiful worship service we talked about in Lesson 3. Well, here in chapter 18, a counter-worship service for the counterfeit god Babylon is attended by the kings, merchants, captains, and sailors, and all who benefited from Babylon's greatness to mourn her great destruction. Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3. After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons, and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all of the nations had drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. In verse 1, after these things lets us know that we are entering a new section of the text. An anonymous angelic herald of doom descends from heaven. His bright appearance and strong voice correspond to the importance of his message. Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the Great. This echoes the refrain of the angel in 14.8 and also mirrors God's original judgment of the earthly city of Babylon back in the book of Isaiah. The great city has now become a barren wasteland that is fit as a jailhouse for unclean spirits, unclean birds, and unclean and hated wild beasts. Earlier verses and earlier chapters have foreshadowed this event, but we are now to the actual occurrence. Verse 3 states the reason for her fall. The nations became drunk on the wine of her fornication. The kings committed sexual immorality with her, and the merchants grew rich from her sensual behavior. The stark sexual language indicates the extent to which economic and spiritual boundaries were violated. Verse 4 and 5. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. So in verse 4, another voice from heaven calls God's people 
to abandon the earthly city, to abandon Babylon the Great. Remember, Babylon the Great is a metaphor for the anti-God culture of this world. Yet this is where we live. We are in the world, not of the world, until Jesus comes back again. So how can we actually leave the city? Well, the people of God can depart only figuratively by actively refusing to accept its norms, values, and beliefs. Leaving Babylon is not a matter of geographic relocation, but rather inner spiritual reorientation. The Christian's journey to the new promised land is a continuous journey of disassociation from the city of this world, a spiritual and political and socioeconomic rebellion against the city's unjust and corrupt values. Verse 6 through 8. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Babylon's demise is also related to her arrogant, prideful rise to heights reserved only for God. Her claim to sovereignty, I rule as a queen, rivals God's sovereignty. The transgressed boundaries represent her quest for deification. Her prideful drive for unlimited power is an assault on the omnipotent God. Babylon cannot even see her own condition accurately. Her arrogance is still on display even though disaster is at the door. I rule as a queen. I am no widow. I will never see grief. Judy and I love old movies, and this scene always reminds me of a movie called Sunset Boulevard, made about 1950, in which a young man meets an aging, silent movie star. And he says, I remember you. You're Nora Desmond. You used to be big. And her reply is, I'm still big. It's the pictures that got small. Well, I think that's a very uh, great line, but it's also very indicative of the pride of Babylon the Great here. Verses 9 and 10. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury sees the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. Three sets of characters, each of which thrived on Babylon's greatness, step forward to lament her loss. Woe, woe, O great city, for in one hour all is lost. John's offstage approach here allows us to see the destruction of Babylon from the perspective of those who once benefited from her wealth. The kings of the earth who economically fornicated with the whore will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. This echoes the mourning of the prince over Tyre in Ezekiel 26 and 27. It's also why I shared with you the story of Old Main and how uh, devastating that was to those of us who loved that old building. Verse 11 through 13. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her, because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and spice, and incense, and perfume, and frankincense, and wine, and olive oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and cattle, and sheep, and cargoes of horses, and chariots, and slaves, and human lives. The merchants add their voice to the lament. I don't know if you were counting, but there are 28 items that were listed, strung together with the word and, allowing each one to stand out from the others. This number, 28, is also significant as it is 4, which is the number of the earth, times 7, 
the number of totality, or in short, all of the products of the whole earth. This symbolizes Babylon's worldwide dominance. The lengthy list also underscores Babylon's gross materialism and money worship. By contrast, many of the items listed, gold, precious stones, pearls, and fine linen, will find their proper place in the New Jerusalem as foundations, gates, streets, and clothing. They become building blocks for the new city that are not worshipped any more than asphalt pavement would be worshipped. Verse 14 through 19. The fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city! She who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. Finally, the captains and the mariners add their lament. Both land and sea express their woe over Babylon's fall. This brings to mind the woe upon the land and the sea we saw back in chapter 12 at the fall of Satan from heaven. In the morning they wail, what city was like the great city? The ironic answer is no earthly city compared with the grandeur and greatness of Babylon the great. Yet in one hour, she is made into a wilderness. Verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. While the kings and the merchants and the mariners mourn and wail over the destruction of Babylon, the saints and apostles and prophets rejoice, for God has pronounced judgment over her for their behalf. Messianic repair of the creation requires that all false gods be put into their proper place, and Babylon is put into her proper place. Babylon's funeral clears the way for a new city and a new creation. As we read through verses 21 through 24, I want you to pay attention to the words, no more. Verse 21, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers, and of musicians, and of pipers, and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the, of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. As I mentioned, the words no more are used to sum up Babylon's destruction. For in Babylon, there will be no more music, craftsmen, no more mill, no more light, no more bride and groom. Part of the beauty of the book of Revelation is how it uses intentional contrast to create a very clear picture of the choices that we face. In chapter 21, we have a description of the new Jerusalem, heaven. And the words no more are also used to describe this city. For you see in the new Jerusalem, there will be no more tears 
no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Lord Jesus, we are thankful to you for your word, for your promises to us. We're grateful for your mercy and your grace. We're grateful for your help each day. And we ask you that this week we could be your hand extended into this world. Help us to be your light as we reflect you to those around us in this darkened world. We're thankful and grateful to you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for participating in this lesson. I hope that you found it helpful. Maybe you might even like it a little bit better in some ways than being in class because this way you can stop it and restart it and replay it if you'd like. Feel free to leave a comment in the space down below. I'd love to hear what you would have to say or if you have any questions for me. Next time we uh, meet, if it's not in person, then we will be doing chapters 19 and 20 covering lesson 10. So watch for a notice about that. Have a good day.